Um, we're really pleased that everyone could come tonight, Lorraine. And I just want to give a little introduction to Anya, who you may not know in person. Um, so I'm just going to tell you that she is a photographic artist. She's of Polish origin, based in Oxfordshire. She came to photography from a literary background, and I think anyone who looks through this book can appreciate that. She has an MA in Literature and Linguistics from the University of Gdansk, Poland, and her work centers around notions of belonging and alienation, memory and amnesia, mental fragility. I to take all that in because the next one is really the zinger. She has a special interest in the topic of femininity and madness. Um, so I just wanted to tell you a bit about, before she tells us about her book, that she um, discovered accidentally a diary by Sophie Godoy Breszka, and she spent five years reading hundreds of her manuscripts in Polish, French, and English, and making trips to Poland, Lviv, Paris, New York, London, and what an under edge to find out more about the writer's tragic but fascinating life. Her work has been exhibited very widely internationally, um, including most recently that I saw in Oxford, and this is her first book. Thank you. So I'm very pleased to be here with Anya, and hand over to you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Christiane, for chairing this event. Uh, thank you, most of all, to the Photographers' Gallery for hosting us here. Uh, special thanks to Martin for uh, organizing everything. Um, and it's, um, it's a really special moment for me to be here because, um, as you know, I, did, I don't have background in photography. I studied literature. Um, so the Photographer's Gallery um, has always been uh, a home for self-education for me. And I've done numerous courses here, um, attended talks. Uh, so it's, it's an incredible moment to be uh, here now and to... Um, uh, talk to you about uh, the book I also find one most. I'm going to sit down because I'm going to run the slides. Um, right, so uh, that's the book. Uh, I also find uh, windmills. It's a literary photo book um, and it's literally for a few reasons. Um, so it centers around the life of a writer uh, about whom I'm going to tell you uh, a bit more uh, about in a minute. Um, it also includes some uh, um, works by the writer, and my f um, um, input in it is a, a photographic imagination or interpretation of uh, those works. So here is uh, Sophie Gaudier Brzeska, a complicated surname, uh, but as, um, it uh, depicts really beautifully the, the kind of linguistic sphere in which uh, she uh, worked. So she wrote in English, in French, and also in her native Polish. Uh, so Sophie for English, Gaudier for French, and Dreska for, for Polish. Um, and it's quite extraordinary for a writer to uh, switch and swap from, uh, between those languages. Um, and that was definitely something that um, drew me to her. Um, and I came across her um, when I found, uh, found out about this book. It's entitled Matka and Other Writings. Um, this, the yellow is the English edition, and then the, the, the purple one is the Polish translation of it. Um, and it's a very, very small print run. I think it's around 100 copies, and it was done by a, a, a gallery um, owner, Gillian Raffles, who used to trade uh, Sophie's partner's works. He was a, he was a sculptor, Henri gaudier Um So Gillian, at some point, I think, acquired a pile of papers at an, at a, at an auction, and then she spent time transcribing the English and translating the bits uh, of the French. Um, and it's a really incredible publication, because it's very, it's, it's unedited. So um, Gillian didn't want to intervene in the text. Uh, so it's really fascinating to see something which, where the editor didn't really uh, enter the, the, the text. Uh, so it's quite raw, quite direct, um, also quite um, chaotic because it was literally a pile of papers. Um, so there, there, is, there is a bit of an autobiography, there are some letters, there are some postcards and so on. 
Um, and when, uh, um, after reading that, I, I was really hooked up. Um, and then I spent some time um, fi trying to find out who Sophie really was. I mean, the, the other level of curiosity was the fact that I'm Polish myself. So, you know, I just wanted to, to know why I had not heard about her beforehand. Um, so there's quite a lot of literature in, in which, um, or, or books in which Sophie features. Uh, but... Um, she very often is a footnote to her partner's story. Um, um, so Henri um, was a very young sculptor when he died. He died in the First World War. Um, so, but what, what I've read, I mean, the, 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 kind of the story was building up, um, and I found it really, really fascinating. There was even a film done in the 70s by Ken Russell entitled The Savage Messiah, where Sophie is brilliantly put, portrayed by Dorothy Tutin. Um, and I work in, a, in, in an academic publisher, uh, so I was really um, uh, surprised that Sophie, despite you know, featuring in so many books, she doesn't really have her own biographical entry. So the kind of beginning of my, of my journey into uh, uh, discovering her life and her work was with an intention to write a biographical entry, and that came out in 2018. Um, but something that I found really fascinating were, were actually the actual archives. So these are boxes, uh, two boxes where Sophie kept her work. Uh, the, the box uh, on the other side is a novel called Hysterical Women, um, which is written in Polish. And I also had a sense that perhaps I was you know, one of the first people who had ever read it, because that work has never been quoted anywhere. Uh, mainly her French and her English texts um, were quoted in those books that I've mentioned. Um, the, the archives are also visually really compelling. Um, and Sophie, um, uh, as I mentioned, moved from one language to the other. She also uh, did some little drawings and scribbles um, on the pages. And there is a, um, a hair... Um, uh, drawing of, of the sun, and the sun is really important for Sophie because she she had a real real fascination with the sun. She kind of felt that the sun had a, a, a real divine quality and was helping her write. Um, so um, uh, I'm mentioning it because you'll see that uh, there are various features from the archive which then made it into the book. Um, there are all sorts of um, little bits and pieces that appear on the manuscripts as well. Uh, something that um, Sophie used during her life. The, the, as you can see, the, the, the handwriting is quite dense. Um, some of the pages were affected by water, uh, so the, the ink from the other page, you can see it through. Um, but the, the way I went about it uh, was um, um, perhaps a bit complicated, because I, I, at that point in time, and also... Um, uh, was directed by the circumstances. So at that point in time, I had two very small children, so I really couldn't go to an archive. Um, and Sophie's works are actually dispersed between three institutions in the UK and one in France. Uh, so I could only venture out for one day, and I would take my point-and-shoot camera and take as many photographs as I could possibly take on the day, and then bring them back home, load them on an iPad, and then read them for weeks and months to come. Um, I, th I mean, that, that was you know, quite a slow process, but at the same time, I didn't have to, um, I didn't have to be away for, for a long time, which was convenient. Um, I also spent quite a lot of time uh, with, with, with the text um, and, and then had, had kind of imagination, Im, Im, uh, imagined images from those, from, from those manuscripts, uh, which helped me to work on the photographic project. Um, uh, so these are the uh, two uh, drawings, a snake, um, and I don't know, a lamina snake perhaps. Um, very few of Sophie's works are actually uh, typed. Um, there are some poems, and the, um, the, 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 the features of the, of, of the type uh, written um, words uh, it was something that I wanted to replicate in, in, in the book. So uh, 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 typewriter's um, font. Um, and also you can see how she worked or reworked her text. So it was really, really fascinating. So she would 
type it and then hand write on top once you wanted to change something. Uh, and this is one of my favourites. Uh, so that's uh, a draft of a novel uh, which she didn't like, so she cut it out. Um, and we'll never know what it contains because I, I have ne never seen uh, the, the, room, the, the, the cut out pages anywhere. But I'm going to show that you put cut out pages here in this book as well. Yes, and then that's you put right. the cut out pages here in the book as well. I'm going to flip the view of a model here. One second. I've gone past it. I will find it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so then I, uh, so th these are my, um, uh, this is my writing actually. So when I was sitting down, uh, commuting to work, I would read a page and then uh, write down uh, the bits that I really liked. Uh, and also I was kind of creating like a meta archive because that, Every, every digital file had a number, and then whenever there was an interesting quote, you know, that number appeared in my notebook um, yeah, there. Ah, there we go, yes. So each of the, so, so the book came out as, um, in, in a limited edition of 300 copies, and I manually cut it out. <laughs> wow. uh, um, that page in, each, uh, in every single copy, and each, each of them is slightly different. Um, uh, I also wanted to find out um, uh, geographically where Sophie was fr from and what it meant for her. Uh, so I, first of all, I went to uh, the part of Poland where she was from. She's from the south of Poland, it's around 150 kilometers east of Krakow, um, whereas I'm from the north. So in a way, it was, it was a, a, an invitation to Dig, dig deeper into the, 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 the section, the region of Poland that I didn't really know very much uh, about. Um, so that's Wączki Brzeskie. <laughs> and Sophie says, empty, monotonous, barren, flat region. Um, and you can, you, you can see that it hasn't really changed uh, that much. Uh, this is one of my first takes on the, the kind of uh, first images that I've started um, uh, started taking at that point. Um, I did a lot of um, archival research as well. So when I was in Krakow, I worked in the city archives there, or the local archives closer to, to, to Sophie's estate. This is the, the oldest uh, image I could find from Wonski, which is probably 1910, by which point Sophie had already left it. Um, it's an image of a school. The school no longer exists. Um, nor does Sophie's family's house. Um, Sophie's uh, father was a lawyer. Her mother was a, came from um, nobility, but the family financially were not doing very well. And in fact, they did terribly badly after they invested a lot of money in fertilizers to get the fields, uh, um, the, the, the soil in the fields um, uh, better and they actually went bankrupt. Um, the house ha had not survived, so I was trying to imagine what he might have been li uh, like. Um, I spent an awful amount of time going through all sorts of albums of manor houses, and manor houses were very often painted or photographed or drawn, and the family would have uh, a picture of it. Um, but there is no, <laughs> to, as far as I could ascertain, <laughs> there, there is no such uh, 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 depiction of, uh, of Sophie's house. So I tried to be as close as I, uh, as I could um, to the houses um, uh, from that region. Um, and at some point, I went to Lviv. Uh, so Lviv was one of the first big cities that Sophie went to. Um, she did some language courses there. So the part uh, of uh, Poland where Sophie came from, at the time, belonged to the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So German was one of the languages spoken there. So Sophie had some German that later helped her when she was looking for a job in, uh, in Paris. Um, but she wasn't very happy in Lviv. Um, and uh, she left, uh, she went to Krakow from there, she went to Paris, uh, because essentially once the family went bankrupt, her mother decided that um, also there were two failed arranged marriages, so Sophie's mother really uh, felt that um, for her the best, uh, uh, the best lifestyle she could have was to get married as soon as possible. Um, that arranged marriages fell through to Sophie's delight. 
Um, and at that point, her mother thought uh, that she should just find herself a, a job and disappear because they had a very, very difficult relationship. Um, so Sophie decided to go to Paris uh, because her uncle lived there and she really loved French. Uh, she didn't speak at, uh, uh, at that point that well. Um, but she had, because she never, she never was allowed to get educated, um, whereas her brothers did go to university. Uh, so she felt that she's always been disadvantaged by her, mom's, uh, by her mother's decisions um, uh, regarding her own life. And she never had proper education, proper professional connections, and so on. Um, but she felt that maybe Paris would be the place where she could, she could do better. Uh, but unfortunately, she, the only jobs that she could get at the time were domestic workers. Uh, so she worked as a nanny, she worked as a cleaner, she worked uh, uh, sometimes as a, as a language uh, tutor. Uh, but she was very unhappy and she really, really wanted to uh, fulfill her artistic ambitions and to become a writer. But after a really monotonous and tiring day, she really could do very little of it. And then at some point, she was taken on by an American family who lived, um, or who visited uh, Paris. Um, she was taken on as a, as a language tutor. So she spoke German, and at that point, she also spoke very good French. So this, these were the languages that she was supposed to uh, teach the, the, the children. Uh, she stayed in Philadelphia for a year, and then she went to uh, New York. Um, and I really love how um, how she depicts the places that she is in. I mean, she uses she doesn't use very many words, but the way she combines them together makes makes it such a vivid um, such a vivid depiction. So about New York, she says, "Awful city, full of noise, banging, and human stupidity." So will she have to live here now in the scorching heat? Um, and when I went to um, when I went to New York to track Sophie down, down um, she so I found out the place where she stayed on and off when she was uh, when she uh, wasn't um, living with a wealthy family uh, as a domestic worker. So that place amazingly still exists. Uh, it's called uh, Joan d'Arc Residence, um, and it's a boarding house for single women. Uh, run by nuns, um, and it still works um, in, uh, under the same rigorous rules. Um, and then I spent quite a lot of time looking through images of New York at the time, and there was so much construction happening. You know, the main bridges were being built, the underground was launched, so it must have been really, really noisy uh, there. Um, and Sophie was getting quite desperate at that point because she, she, went, she went to so many cities, to so many places, and she really didn't um, manage to um, find space and time to, to write. Um, so then she decided that it wasn't, there wasn't much point being tired and frustrated in New York anymore, and then she took another passage um, as a sea voyage back to Europe um, and then she went initially to Paris where she really hoped, hoped to settle down then she went back to uh, her homeland she lived uh, temporarily with her mother and then we're going to listen to some of the pictures of that moment quite dramatic ones um, and she couldn't really find way out of this really restrictive um, social position that she, she, was, she was in um, so she went to Paris and she, was, she thought that she went to Paris for the last time in 1909. So she really wanted to end her life um, and she felt that she would do it in style, she would do it in Paris. Uh, she also was hoping that her body would get cremated, which she felt would not be possible uh, in Poland. So she came to really, really um, uh, in, de in deep despair, uh, but things turned out very differently for her. Um, so she was, uh, suddenly she found herself on the left bank uh, uh, in Paris, uh, surrounded by women who started going to Sorbonne. Uh, uh, there were course, courses for women um, which started a few years back, um, and then Sophie attended them. And then, and then at that point also she met Henri. Uh, so Henri Godier, that was his name, and he was nearly uh, 19 years younger. Uh, and Sophie was Breska uh, to start with, but then they 
they they had this idea they will they will uh, travel to England. They both knew English, uh, and they will swap their surnames. And it was quite an incredible um, arrangement. I mean, first of all. It was done for, for the social re uh, uh, reasons, so they wanted to have lodgings together, so they pretended to be half-siblings. Uh, but at the same time, they both uh, had this incredible urge to be uh, creatives, uh, so it was an artistic alliance between them. But as I've mentioned, Henri died during the First World War, um, and Sophie lived for another 10 years. Um, and I did a, last year when I did a, a, a solo exhibition of this work in Oxford, I collaborated with an uh, actor, Verity Kirk, so she did voice over narrations um, of so Sophie's text, so I thought we'll listen to one now. To be treated the same as my brothers, they get an education secure a future for themselves, whereas I'm stuck here in the countryside like a dog on a chain, mending their trousers. Complain to God for not making you a boy. It's not just men who work to earn their daily bread. Marry him. He's got a position. He'll take you to ballrooms. Thank you. I'd rather hang myself on a dry branch or drown. We don't have money. You know that perfectly well. Hell, hell, hell. Tortures, scandals. Father's been losing calamitous trials which, for a few years, have been threatening his complete ruin. The approaching bankruptcy made it clear to her that she would have to make her living abroad. What could she do? Only one solution to teach children, however much she hated it, it was the only thing. So you go to, oh, sorry. Um, so, so I talked a lot about Sophie because the writing is very autobiographical. So in a way, uh, one, um, you, you, can, you can hear the, um, the, the stories of her journeys, of, of, uh, of the lives of the characters who are domestic workers living in wealthy, uh, with wealthy families. Um, um, uh, and, you, uh, and, and also, um, very often, it, in the, because you, I had access to the very first draft of something, very often um, in the depiction of it, the actual name of the place would be there and then Sophie later would erase it or change it. Um, so that really helped me to track her down. Um, and then I had, so the writing, um, the, the lives of the, of, of the, of the characters, they're mainly uh, young, young women uh, who really want to succeed in life, but given the, their circumstances, they can't really fulfill their artistic ambitions. Um, so, and, and they go through this cycle of um, being very excited. They work out a new plan, and they're really excited about it, and they go and try it out, so they, the character goes to Paris. Um, and then it turns out that there is actually, there is isn't either no job, or the job that she gets is really horrible and doesn't really get her anywhere. So then, <clears throat> so then she gets really depressed. Um, but then something, else, then she wakes up with another plan. So, so you go through these cycles, and you also go through these um, uh, emotions, which are quite extreme. So they'll be really like being hyper, re re really joyful about something, and then really frustrated, desperate, um, and then depressed. You know, even suicidal. Um, so I had those. Um, so I had those uh, uh, emotions almost imprinted in my mind at that point because I spent so much time <coughs> reading the text. <coughs> Excuse me. And then I felt that black and white photography would really suit the the the, the interpretation uh, of 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 the written work. Um, and I really wanted the dark, the black, to be really deep black uh, in it. So that's. Oh, sorry. Um, um, so that's that's one of the um, that's one of the female characters, and I worked with um, uh, two friends, 
uh, who were impersonating um, them. Um, and I, and you can see that she's looking out, and I think there is still, thank you, there is still um, uh, a way of working out something for herself. Um, but Sophie and also her, uh, her characters um, <clears throat> were, were very disadvantaged by the, not only by the social setup, but also by the domestic setup. So Sophie's mother didn't really um, help her. Um, she herself um, had quite low, low moods. Um, and, uh, and I wanted to bring that to the work as well. Um, so I'll, sh I'll show you some of the images here. Um, Sophie and her characters also had a, uh, an obsession with Moon, and the Moon was the opposite of the Sun. It was an evil force, and very often when she would walk um, uh, in the evening or at night, she would try to turn her back um, towards the Moon, feeling that it would really uh, curse her or bring something really bad into her life. Um, the characters have also an incredible self-awareness that they cannot really repeatedly um, find way out of this very difficult situation. Um, and Sophie and then Maria and Steph, you know, all those, um, uh, double, uh, all, all those alter egos in her, in her text um, are kind of aware that there is only madness at the end of that journey. And Sophie, um, sadly, was forcefully taken to a mental asylum in Gloucester, and this is where she died. Um, the mental asylum itself uh, doesn't exist anymore. It's only a frontal building, quite imposing building, actually. Uh, but it's turned into uh, uh, quite luxurious flats, and it's gated. Um, so it's not very accessible. And I wanted, when I was, when I was uh, working on, 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 on this series, I wanted to bring that setup of a Victorian um, uh, asylum into, into it. So I found out um, that there was, um, there is actually a, um, a former mental asylum not far from where I, not far from where I live, and it's beautifully preserved. So I had walks with the historian who told me a little bit more about it. Uh, so some of the images were, were taken there, and the whole. Um, the whole project, including the bookmaking, um, took seven years. So at some point, I started taking self-portraits because I felt that I was actually part of it, uh, that I became uh, one, of the, one of the characters there, despite the fact that there is very little overlap between my life and Sophie's life. Um, uh, so I've mentioned, and I thought I'll, I'll finish by just showing a, a couple of images from the book where you will see um, the features from, from the archive. So there is the cutout page. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, the, last, uh, uh, the last section of the book. You can't see very well here, but these are names that Sophie was called. Uh, so while I was doing the research, I was writing down all those names that she was called, and they really uh, entertaining, they shocking at the same time. So she was called a scorpion by her mother. She was called Beauty a la Baudelaire by her partner. Um, uh, she was called Volcanic Nature, all sorts of things. So they, I felt that it would be quite interesting to weave them into, uh, into the book and keep them there, um, just to give you another sense of what the writing is all about. Um, and the writing appears in the book on smaller pages, so it's almost like a literary book within a photographic book. Um, and the yellow um, as a color was really important uh, for the project uh, because um, that's the color of the original archive. Um, it also fits with a saying in Polish to have yellow papers, which means to have been admitted to a mental asylum. Um, so here is another recording. My project has been stopped for a long time. I contemplated suicide as a finale for an insoluble problem. I was at the Marat's home, just in case our understanding with N should be settled. I would take a post as governess and be happy with a little kindness he might wish to bestow on me. 
At least I thought so. Perhaps I hoped to go and live with him. I had no clear or precise idea. I clung to life again in spite of everything. Death in my heart. I deluded myself by looking for a job. Still, everything had the look of a grave to me. More than sad. I lay for hours on end on the sofa to contemplate my final decision. I still paid the mug out for my food, even though her sister and brother-in-law did everything to make life completely insupportable for me. Too coarse to comprehend or even suspect my sadness, they called me moody, disagreeable, angry, etc. The aunt with a large stomach had moments of vulgar pity, telling me, poor girl, Something is lacking. Nevertheless, it is a shame you did not marry a eh, the big fellow the mother had chosen for you. He was very stupid and ridiculous. But it seemed he had a very good nature. Then I leapt to the ceiling in fury, making the fat twit cower. The mother smiled happily and commented with the charm of a viper, Look, what gall. Such a scorpion. I told you, but you did not want to believe. Now, you have proof. So I am indignant. But since I did not leave, in spite of the hell made for me by the noble trio, the Morat had the happy idea of suggesting to me two more partners. Good men from the neighbourhood, coarse even without any education, but possessing some property. Sometimes... In my clinging on to life. Clinging on because I felt the void that I must leave behind me. Nothing accomplished. Not any living soul who regretted my leaving. What emptiness. What depressing emptiness. I was passing through life as a brute. As an imbecile without leaving humanity a trace of my passage, all while burning with a fire of creativity. Now, sometimes in these clinging trials, I sometimes said to myself, I will go from here not only without accomplishing anything, but without even having in some way the joy of life. If I were really going to take some fellow to marry, I could perhaps in time tie myself down to that stupid life. Or perhaps even having comfort, I could accomplish the dreamed of work, attain glory, and by this event, all the injustices and humiliations that have been inflicted on me, and even contribute to the betterment of humanity whose damages I see. But immediately the sensation of pure love rebelled, making my body wretch and tighten around my heart evoking in me an insurmountable repugnance. I should have said that um, Sophie, Sophie's mother called her Scorpion, but Sophie, whatever wrote about her mother, and even actually when she uh, wrote a letter to her uh, from Paris when she wanted to end her life, uh, she always addressed her as stepmother. So in the, um, in the text we've got Marat, uh, which is the French um, uh, equivalent. Um, so I think I'll stop here. And it's the most unusual photo book that I've seen in a very long time. We're sitting in a photographer's gallery, we're talking about your photography, and this is a piece of literature, and it's an, an amazing book of research as well. It's quite, it's quite distinctive, so I just wanted to point that out and hope everyone has a chance to at least look through it. Um, and consider the many years of research that you put into it. Um, so, congratulations on this amazing. How many years have you been working on this? Uh, so uh, probably yes, yeah, several in seven in total, seven including in total. the book. But it, that includes the bookmaking as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I wanted to maybe take you back into thinking about this this book as the object and your interplay with photography. First of all, can you tell us why you've chosen the title of the book? Can you, can uh, yes. you go into, I also fight windmills. So I'll read, yes. what do you think of Don Quixote? His character is a bit like mine. 
I also fight windmills, and there's also the beautiful little drawings that Sophie's done in the inside cover here. Yes. Um, so the, the title is a quote from Sophie. Um, it comes from one of the letters uh, which she uh, wrote to her friend. Um, and the title sets the, the, the tone uh, for, for the work. So it brings Sophie in, in straight away. Uh, and it also um, puts her in a, in a kind of literary con context of... Um, so Don Quixote, obviously, you know, a very interesting literary figure. He, he, he lives almost in a, in a parallel para, para reality, you know, very much uh, uh, inspired by, in, uh, by um, uh, romance, um, uh, lives of knights, and so on. Um, and Sophie, to an extent, was also shaped by books. I mean, she read voraciously. Uh, she was really interested in biographies of very famous people. Uh, she read biography of Nietzsche, of uh, Beethoven, uh, and, and so on. She was really, really intrigued. You know how you make it. You know how you make uh, make it, make an artistic career. How you leave, as she said, um, uh, a trace of yourself. You know in your passage uh, through the world. Um, uh, and it's also. Um, I think it also signals failure because we know what happens to Don Quixote and um, and Sophie's life is actually very tragic. Um, you know, she died in a mental asylum. She died forgotten, and and I hope that you know she will be fully um, uh, discovered because uh, the writing is really, really fascinating. Well, I think that you worked very hard to to make her voice heard. Mm -hmm. And and the things that she has to say about um, about her endurance and about surviving and about being a person not of great means and needing to to work to have subsistence and mm -hmm. always looking to find that place that home that sanctuary to enact her own creativity. So I just wanted to think about you as an artist. Are there any kind of biographical mm, relationships, things that you kind of reflected and said, ah, oh, this is, might inform the kind of photography I want to make? Mm -hmm. So to start with, uh, I was really driven by a sense of discovery, you know, having you know, studied uh, literature myself, you know, having read the works of, of, of the great, suddenly there was something which was completely raw, completely unedited. And that's really, you know, that was really, really uh, fascinating. Um, but m in terms of um, kind of our, I mean, I, I really felt for Sophie, because I think it's really important to have your kind of emotional artistic home, you know, to have your own space, you know, not to... It's really difficult to work when you don't really have the place where you can you can anchor yourself. Um, and you know, she led a very nomadic life. You know, my life is fairly stationary. Uh, but I really felt that you know the kind of the, that um, desire to have something so basic but so important. Um, I think we'll speak to all of the artists. I mean, it's so important to have your own space, whether it's a studio, whether it's a kitchen table, which is where you need to, where you can do what you would like to do. I mean, something that um, on a kind of different emotional level spoke to me um, was, was definitely that sense of, that sense of despair at, at, at a certain point in my life. Um, that um, I felt really resonated with me. Um, so I came from literary uh, background. I used to do events around uh, authors and, and, uh, and books. But at, when my first daughter was born, she was born really dramatically with a severe brain injury. And at that point, like, I had no words. I mean, my word around me really shrank. And all I could feel was this incredible darkness around me and I felt that you know that was something that um, that Sophie depicted so so powerfully um, uh, so yeah so I think that there were you know there were lots of things that resonated with me I mean also the way she writes you know she doesn't really she doesn't really use that many words but the image that she creates um, is uh, it's really it's really wonderful um, 
I do invite everyone to have a look at the yellow texts in the book. We jump right in to a quite extraordinary one with lots of dashes. And, uh, and yes. I think she might have enjoyed TikTok. And I think she would have had a lot of followers and been very persuasive and very gotten her message out there because, you know, you just want to read it out loud and shout it when mm -hmm. she's writing. Um, I think also, just on what you mentioned before, you, you're you interested to think about how much can we can we bear before we begin to fall apart. And mm -hmm. I think that, that resonates a lot with me in, mm -hmm. in thinking about how you make that visible. Um, also, you know, what I mentioned earlier, interest in femininity and madness. And, you know, we haven't really talked about hysteria, but mm -hmm. that what she was probably diagnosed with and uh, put in institution with, or, you know, hysteria and all the, the feminine um, acting out of her, of her conditions and her thoughts, they, she couldn't contain them all. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was very interested to see how does that impact the, the images that you make and when you you and your other model mm -hmm. um, friends um, perform for the camera. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I, um, initially I felt that I, I needed to have someone um, impersonating the characters, um, but at the same time, you know, there are moments where, where things blur around the character when life becomes impossible. Um, so I worked, I, I, I tried to use various techniques to bring it into the, the, the visual language. So I used where uh, I uh, made the images unsharp on purpose or distorted. I did double or multiple exposures to kind of show um, that incredible on the one hand, entrapment, but then, and the other, on, on the other hand, also a way of trying um, get it out of 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 your body. Um, I use um, uh, an experimental lens which distorts the edges, and I felt that was quite a quite a good device for the subject matter. Um, uh, so, so the image is almost quite crude because you know the the character runs away and everything becomes quite blurry on uh, on the edges. So I was trying to I was trying to bring the the concept of hysteria into the the, the working of um, of, um, of, of of making of the photographs. Um. No, it's 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 really wonderful. I mean, I think we also get so many views into her state of mind when you quote things in your research here. And if I, if I may, to Henri, I'm too old to be your lover, but I could be your mother if you want. <laughs> it's yeah. wonderful. I think when I learned art history, we learned about Henri and he had kind of a mistress and there was a painting that he did of her. Yes. And that's it. And then there was a picture in the back, the portrait, I'm trying to find it now, the portrait in the back, and I did a double take, and I wasn't sure if that was you or if that was Sophie, the side portrait, which is the one you can oh, see that, on that's Wikipedia. Definitely, yes, that's so this is the portrait, and I kind of thought, well, I haven't seen Anya in a while, and we met on Zoom, and you know, I'm not sure if that's her or not, because I don't know who this is, but that's actually Sophie. Yes, that's the only surviving photograph by an unknown photographer of Sophie. Um, and on Wikipedia, she looks the other way. Yeah, so she's um, she's actually turned to the text on purpose. Ah, yeah, she's so, so, yeah, 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 yeah. But the, but the, that photograph was really important uh, because her family calls her ugly uh, in on multiple occasions. But actually, when you look at the photograph, she's just the opposite. Um, so it kind of plays into the relate the f family relationships um, uh, quite well. Um, well, um, she. She, I don't know if she has such a great relationship with anyone. Because when she drafted her, her last will and testament while she was still quite well, she wrote, leaving this world, I have no one to thank as I do not know anyone anything. <laughs> yes. And I think that's yeah. brilliant. Um, and I just want to thank you for your wonderful creativity and sharing this all with us. Um, I'd like to now open up to other questions in the audience before we um, go to our open bar. Uh, I was just wondering, I mean, you immersed yourself for uh, seven years. Did you ever fall out with her? Did you, you know, I can imagine sort of mm -hmm. being so 
at some point of not, I don't know, obsession, but being, her being such a big part of your life. Did you, did you ever think? Yeah, I mean, you have to, you have to, you know, you have to take um, Sophie's writing down and take a deep breath, you know, uh, at times. The, the, the reason why it also took me so long is that, you know, I, I work quite slowly and I worked around the family life as well. Um, uh, and also the fact that it's in three languages, I can read two of those. So the, the French was, um, uh, was handed over to family members who were translating it for me. Um, so, and also, I, I felt a great, great sense of responsibility that I was um, trying to describe someone, someone's life, so I really wanted to do it as accurate as possible. Um, I wanted to make sure that, you know, what I'm, what, what, what I'm finding is definitely true um, and, and, and correct. So that in itself takes a, takes a long time. Um, but it was also a fascinating journey. And I think you really can't do someone's life justice. I mean, the life is just so big um, that to, to then condense it into something short, so there is a biographical essay at the end of the book, um, uh, to focus on, on some things, not the others. Uh, you know, there were quite difficult choices that I, that I had to, to make. But the photography was something that, you know, I felt like that's the freedom. You know, I don't have to be very precise, that's my interpretation, that's my imagining. So the, the character very often wears a black dress, and the black dress was on purpose, it's quite um, universal. Um, and it's something that doesn't really place you any epoch quite, quite quickly, it doesn't. Uh, there were some things which, where I hinted the times where the characters lived and where Sophie lived. But that was not um, uh, so important to me. So it wasn't supposed to be a costume drama. Um, it was supposed to be a personal interpretation of someone's text. But at the same time, because the texts are so inaccessible, I mean, you have to really make an appointment, go to those special collections and, and read them and handle the, the three languages. I felt that the book should contain the, the, the text because there is so much in it. So in a way, it could be an invitation to all of you because I'm sure there will be something in Sophie's life that you will find interesting and you could work with artistically in whatever form you would like. Um, so there was one image um, which I showed you earlier, which is my self-portrait with a mirror turned into the viewer. And that was precisely that gesture to, to maybe see whether there is anything that resonates with the, from the story of her life, from the story of her characters, from my images with you. Um, sorry, long answer. I know it's a fantastic book. Could you say a little bit about when you decided which images you create for it? Was it as you were mm -hmm. first in the text, or you went back to read it to find points, or? Yes, I, was, um, I took images while I travelled, uh, but those images were mainly... I really wanted to depict the, the, the places, so there were many documentaries. You could see uh, the early images, they, they're in colour, because uh, they are shot, all of them are shot digitally, I work with digital camera. Um, so, so then I wanted to find my own language and, and alter the images so that they would fit uh, the subject matter. Um, and they too, they too um, came about quite organically. So I was sometimes restricted by time or place. So when I was in Poland, I was there for a specific period of time. I might have not necessarily had the model, uh, but then I could manipulate the image so it had the right setup and brought, and, and brought the character later on. Um, it was also the avail availability of, of, of the friends that I worked with. Uh, one of them relocated back to Poland, uh, so at some point, you know, she 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 wasn't there. Um, there was I was really lucky to be given access to uh, an old Victorian house of a of a school headmaster, which which features um, um, felt really appropriate for the story. Uh, so we had one day there um, to, 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 to take photographs before it was done up. Uh, and it's actually um, a really beautiful place in Wallingford, which um, was turned into art studios. So that felt also quite, uh, quite appropriate. Uh, 
um, that you know a desolate building would become uh, really a haven for artists. Um, well, thank you very much. I think in the interest of time, yes. I would invite everyone to have a drink and come downstairs, and Anya will be with her books. Can I, can I ask one question? Sorry, yes. how, many, how many books are left if you've only got 300? Oh, uh, yes, <laughs> yes, there are definitely like zero. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there are less than 100 left. So, yeah, if you'd like a copy, uh, yeah, please feel free to pop into the bookshop. Come downstairs and find your favorite quote by Sophie because they're fabulous. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.